such a good one and yesterday thankful for all the visitors who certainly came our way and they of course today have been at their respective congregations and we're thankful for you and we certainly look forward to hearing this last sermon. Actually we've already had Brother Oxendine introduced to us but uh, for those who may have missed he has been preaching for 27 years the San Mateo congregation, San Mateo, California. We've been glad to have Pam Hackworth, his wife, with us. A lot of times I've been with Johnny and she hadn't been there. But you know, one time in England I was over there and he wasn't there and you and the daughter were there. So anyway, we're glad to have you here now. And Johnny's going to be speaking to us on the church contends for the faith. But now, something that has nothing to do with his ability as a gospel preacher or this subject, but something, you know, there's always things in the background of people, especially preachers that some people never find out. Johnny is an art connoisseur, and I am not saying that lightly. He's an art critic, and he loves art. And if you want to learn everything there is in art appreciation when it comes to a matter of modern art in particular, just go with him to some of these museums and you can stand 30 minutes before each one of them and he will tell you about the artist and all of what they're doing. And believe it or not, you will see more in that piece of art when he gets through. I say that complimentary because some of the things you took us to see in England, I would, to me it was a bed sheet hanging on the wall and somebody threw stuff at it. But when he, started, <laughs> when he got through explaining it, in fact, I think you even uh, wrote... Uh, in the newspaper, you were, what, what was your title? I, I was an art critic. Art critic. And uh, New York Times? No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he went to California doing that, though, many years ago. But he's a fine gospel preacher, and we traveled the world together, at least part of the world together, and enjoyed ourselves much, especially in the U.K., in preaching the gospel. They're doing a wonderful work over there. Uh, I decided some years ago to cease to be the director, and I turned to Johnny and said, would you direct that lectureship? And he's expanded it. We still have it in Cambridge, but it goes also into other places that he's made contact with, and he has done a great job, and the men that work with him, we appreciate him. Johnny, come speak to us on the church contents of the faith. I do remember the time that that David asked if I would be able to uh, continue with the preaching the whole Council of God lectures over in the UK in Cambridge, and thankfully, uh, thanks to God, the congregation in San Mateo was uh, willing and able to take on that work, and we've been able to enlarge it. Uh, and, of course, Brother Danny has been with us for several years. We're very glad to have had him and Bruce uh, and others who have been with us. Uh, we are looking across these roles at some of these young men, a lot of them over in that area. And we're going to have them with us, even if they don't know it. But I want them to know it. And the families that they'll have to leave, if they have to leave them, to come with us and they can bring their families too. And we're gonna have a wonderful time, uh, not sightseeing, but teaching and preaching and encouraging the brethren there in a variety of ways. Uh, <clears throat> we did go to some art museums. It was Brother David and uh, John. And I told them, I said, uh, you may not like what you're going to see, so I'll pay for it. <laughs> that way, if it, you don't lose anything, right? And we had a wonderful time, enjoyed uh, the Tate Modern, that was the one we were in. Uh, anyway, that part of life is on a different side, you know. Uh, uh, years ago, and I'll say years ago, and some of you, will in an uncomfortable way probably remember this. 
Flip Wilson did a skit. And in this particular skit, uh, Christopher Columbus comes to America. So Christopher Columbus comes to America and he makes uh, contact with the Indians and or Native Americans. He made contact and he stood in, in front of them and they looked at him as a very odd and unusual uh, person and they said, who are you? And Columbus said, well, I'm Christopher Columbus. And he said, okay, why are you here? He said, well, I'm here to discover you. And they said, well, we don't want to be discovered. And you can just take your, your stuff and turn around and discover somewhere else. And that made me think about some years ago, Brother Ira Rice began, uh, began a publication. And that publication was determined to discover and inform where error was being taught and perpetrated in the church where brethren were teaching false doctrine, where they were contributing to uh, disaster relief and missionary societies and hiring denominational preachers uh, for their pulpits and schools and where brethren were in fellowship with the Christian church and worse. And you get the picture. And the brethren, rather than thanking Brother Rice, in so many words, said, we don't want to be discovered. That work continues and commend the congregation here and the elders and Brother Brown for continuing that work, continuing for the faith. The title itself says a lot says a lot about what you stand for, it says a lot about what the Christian has a responsibility toward. And we look at that from the standpoint of the written word in Jude, of course, 1 and verse 3. And we see that very phrase, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered for all time to the saints. What did Jude mean when he said that? What did he mean? Well, it's as plain as what it says on the page, to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now the question then would be, why did he have to say that? Why did he have to say that? He had to say that because when we look here, we know that the New Testament Christian then and now, then even as the apostles walked on the earth, and now as we do the same, we have to defend and fight for the truth. We have to defend the scriptures that were once for all time delivered by God to man. There is no reason to suppose that Jude meant anything other than the gospel. And this is where we find oftentimes breakdowns in congregations as to who exactly has that responsibility. For some people, they think that the contending for the faith is the responsibility of the preacher and the elders and that no one else has anything to worry about. You guys take care of that. You are the ones who have that responsibility. But again, let's go back over to the passage. And it says, To those who are called, sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. He's talking to all the Christians. He's not just talking to the preacher or the elders or the deacons or the men. He's talking to everyone. 
with the responsibility to defend the gospel. And when we say, well, what is the gospel? We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. We get an encapsulated uh, portion of it there. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We go back over to the book of Jude, and he addresses that problem. The problem of false teaching. Because it was so pervasive in the first century. See, now we've become so sophisticated, we don't have false teaching anymore. We sort of squeezed it out, didn't we? We know that's not true. Because there has always been a clear and present danger facing the church. A horrifying danger that always lies right over the horizon, and we say, what is that? It is the danger of false teaching. Now, before we go too far, we'll stop and say that this is a subject that makes people uncomfortable. Some people become very uncomfortable when we talk about false teaching because some of it spreads across areas in our own lives, with our own families. Some of it spreads in our workspaces with the people who are our friends and our relatives and our neighbors. And some people, they, they bring out a phrase which we'll deal with March 4th in our radio um, class with the UK. I'll provide more information about that later. They say, well, can't you speak the truth in love? And you can speak the truth in love. But that doesn't prevent you from defending the faith. It doesn't prevent us from addressing false teaching doesn't prevent us from any of those things. Because if a Christian is swayed by false teaching, we see this begins with Eve, then that person can find themselves losing everlasting life. Any person who denies that God sent his son into the world to save man, anyone who denies that Jesus is the son of God, anyone who in any way contradicts what you find in the New Testament is guilty of false teaching. They'll never be pleasing to God. They'll never have eternal life. That person is doomed to be cut off from God. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of God's Son, Matthew, Mark 16, 15, and 16. Time and again, God warns believers of apostasy. It's the very reason for the book of Jude. It is also what we see in the second epistle of Peter, chapter 2. He spends the whole chapter talking about false teaching. You have to ask, why is it so frequently mentioned in the scriptures, false teaching as a problem that the church has to face, that individuals have to address, and yet in the world today, in many places, no one wants to talk about error. No one wants to talk about the era of marriage, divorce, remarriage, AD 70, and a number of other issues that fortunately here in some other places but I'm talking here about Brother Brown, the eldership. They have not backed away from defending the faith. And what that, what that means is they put themselves out and they have targets on their back and, and you have targets on your backs. Because the people who do not love the truth, who do not love God, and they'll say, well, where is it that you attend? I attend the Spring Church of Christ. Oh, that group, those people, Ken Cone, 
John West, David Brown, scoundrels. You see, they hate you when you stand for the truth. You may say, brethren can't hate you. They will be as vile and vicious as one could be. We go back to what Jude is talking about here. And it's not, as we said, it's not an unusual thing because strong warnings about false teaching issued by Paul in the book of Galatians and, and, and Colossians and Thessalonians and Timothy and Titus, all of those books include warnings about false teaching. The book of Hebrews, Jesus himself gave warnings time and again throughout the gospel. And no matter who a person is, that person, no matter how well liked, no matter how influential, no matter how charismatic, no matter how attractive their teaching may be, if they deny the truth of the New Testament in any place, they are a false teacher. That's the thrust of Jude's letter. It's the very purpose for which he wrote. And you go into those first two verses after the salutation at the beginning. He says, of course, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase this a little bit. I, I wanted to write to you. He's, uh, I'm just paraphrasing. This is not a new version. I was planning to write to you about the common salvation, but I have to write to you to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith. We look back at where Paul is speaking to the elders of Ephesus in Miletus. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. Take heed therefore unto yourselves to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock and of your own selves, Men shall arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now, we can't really know what it must have felt like to have been there listening to Paul at that time, except that we can see through the divine word as it's been given to us by God that Paul was talking to these brethren about a very serious matter. A lot of things in life are not serious, frivolous, carefree, fun, entertainment. But here as he says for himself, these men will speak perverse things. And what are we to do about that? From the opening verses, we know that there are various scenarios that will take place over the course of time where there is going to be the possibility of apostasy. We know that there is going to be hostility. We know that there is going to continue to exist from this day until the end of time where the defense of the faith will be costly but that defense for all of us is a duty. It falls on every generation of the church. From when Brother Brown began to preach, I think he was about 16 or 18, I don't remember. I wasn't there and until now. And this will continue for his kids, his grandkids, his great-grandkids, however long this earth shall be allowed to stay. The little ones in the back, when they grow up, they're faithful to God, they'll be defending the truth. Why? Because there will always be false teachers. There will always be error. We'll never go down a sliding board and have it easy as New Testament Christians. And so we are to contend for the faith especially as we see targeted here by Jude against false teachers. 
And this, as we said, he planned to write about something very pleasant. You, you like to hear, I was at a concert once, uh, Keith Jarrett concert, and someone said from the audience, can we have an upbeat tune? Can we have something upbeat? And we like to have those sermons that are positive, that are upbeat, uplifting. But we also have to be aware of the realities in life and what we face. I'm sure that everyone would like to be able to get up in the morning, open up their morning paper, put their foot on the table, and just enjoy themselves. But we can't, can we? We have to get up and go to work. We have to do something else. And so Jude is forced to warn brethren about the dangers of apostasy. That meant that they're going to have to go to war, to spiritual war. And we earnestly contend, we fight for the truth, we fight for the word of God, that some of revelation from God, which Christians believe, that guides and directs our path towards salvation. The commands of God, the truth of the scripture. He speaks of it in a way that encourages us to be diligent. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. We're going to talk about that. But he does tell them that they cannot and we cannot buckle under the pressure. And again, I want to commend this congregation and the brethren because you have remained strong. Sometimes you lose members. You, sometimes you lose friends. Sometimes you lose relatives because you're going to stand. You're going to have to stand for the truth. Or you're going to have to be against God. That's difficult because we like we like for people to like us. We like to be popular. We like to be among the group. But sometimes when you stand for the truth, that's going to separate you from others. It's going to isolate us. It's going to marginalize us. It's going to put us in a place that is often uncomfortable. And sometimes people don't want to be uncomfortable. But what does, what does he talk about here? He says that certain men had unknowingly crept into the church and were teaching false doctrine. Men had crept in unnoticed, long ago marked out for this condemnation. He begins to talk about these people and the, the characteristics and the judgment of false teachers. And we'll certainly talk about the judgment of false teachers, how egregious false teaching is to God. And that's the most important point. It's egregious to God. So in some sense, it doesn't matter if we like it. It's our responsibility to defend it. And he talks about them. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Whoever therefore shall break one of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. These men crept in unknowingly. That, mean, that meant that they came in and one thing was certainly true. They did not love God. They did not come in. Oh, but if they would come in and be dressed as false teachers. That would make it so much easier, wouldn't it? They could come in with their sign. You know, there are some groups out on the West Coast, and you know immediately what groups they belong to. They wear their different little colors, and some of them have all sorts of tattoos and, and head things, you know, these little things sticking up out of their heads. And, you know, we see this every day for like breakfast. You, out, and you see these things and you wonder. But uh, no one's going to come in and say, 
Uh, Brother Cone, uh, I'm here from North Texas. I'm here from wherever. And I just want you to know I'm a false teacher. And I'm going to sit over here and I'm going to wait until everybody has is, is gotten to know me really well and becomes very friendly toward me. And, and then I'm going to start spreading my doctrine. That's not how it happens, is it? That's not how it happens at all. And that's why he said they come in, they creep into the church. That tells us that their ambitions are nebulous. We ask, how does this happen? How do they enter the church unnoticed? They come in and then eventually you begin to hear, possibly surfacing in conversations, possibly surfacing in classes. You begin to hear slight unsound sound. Uncertain sounds. Slight changes in doctrinal, on doctrinal issues. Issues that affect salvation. We've had it in the church for years in many different flavors of era, un marriage, divorce, remarriage. A touchy subject. It's a touchy subject for people. The Bible's clear, but it's a touchy subject for people. AD 70 and so forth, even accepting the baptisms of certain denominations, which you'd mentioned before. They don't really believe something about the Bible. They don't really believe in Jesus Christ. They've accepted some part of it, but they're denying other parts of it. They're trying to change it. They're trying to get us to go along with their changes. They want to make it a little more liberal. And there are people who will go along with it. But let's look at how the Bible describes some of these people. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. It's interesting the various ways in which it's described. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That is how Paul wrote to Timothy about false teachers. He said that they have the doctrines of devils. And we probably have relatives who hold to some of these doctrines of devils. We don't want to perhaps admit that Aunt Rita or Uncle Christopher is in that category, but the Bible is pretty clear. It's either Matthew 12, 30, either for me or against me. He wrote to Titus, they profess that they know God, but in their works deny him. And how does, how does Paul describe them? Abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. In the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, Satan himself. Is transformed into an angel of light. Make no mistake. When we find ourselves, when you find yourself confronting and confronted by false teaching, false doctrine, you are confronting the devil. No matter from whom you hear it, it is Satan who is behind false teaching. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now that tells us in verse 4, when he talks about this, long ago marked out, it tells us about the fact of judgment for these people. Judgment is awaiting them. God has ordained from before from the beginning of this world, that unbelievers shall be judged. 
And Jesus and in Scripture, other Scripture, teach us that the judgment for false teachers is to be far more severe. The judgment for false teachers is far more severe than for other persons. Again, back in Matthew 5 and 19, whosoever shall break one of these of the, of the least commandments and shall teach men, shall be the least in the kingdom. Whosoever offend, it will be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul, astonished, shocked at what he had been hearing, wrote to the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would, what, pervert the gospel. Would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then Paul, in one of the strongest worded statements that we find regarding false teaching. But though we, meaning the apostles, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have pre that we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And I'm sure that you know that word transliterated in the American standard, anathema, means to be separated from God. The thing is, is that he reiterates that. He says, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any of the gospel unto you, then that which we will have received, let him be accursed. Now, over in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, he again gives a picture, an illustration of God's view of people who are false teachers. A false teacher can't be your friend. I, want, I wanted to make that clear as well. A false teacher cannot be your friend. Not if they're trying to undermine the gospel of Christ. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and, and, and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse than them, uh, for them than the beginning. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit again. A person who has learned the truth and then become a false teacher I look at that illustration metaphorically as, as an apt description. A dog returning to his own vomit, a sow that was washed in her wallowing in the mire. Now do not forget, false teachers are ungodly. They do not live like God would have us to live. As a matter of fact, in verse 4, that term is used several times. We know that God is perfect. He is moral. He is just. He is loving. He is forgiving. He is all of those things. But false teachers do not teach the truth of God's love and purity demonstrated in Christ because they veer off the path of righteousness. They profane God and the truth of his love and godliness. And at all times they fight against it. And it does not matter if what they're teaching is false it has to be opposed Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness who hold the truth in unrighteousness and then Peter writes, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 18, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? These are descriptions that certainly apply again to false teachers. For if God spared not the angels that sin, and again, we should, we should recognize this. If God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world, but saved Noah. Now, 
That's what he's talking about. Again, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The idea of judgment. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, The heavens and earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved in the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of what? Ungodly men. Jude describes these people as ungodly. And so when we look at that verse, certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained of this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, Jude is dealing with something specific. Certainly during this time, you're dealing with Gnosticism and a variety of other false, false teaching. But it doesn't matter what the false teaching is, it's false. And it doesn't matter when it occurs, it has to be opposed He continues this thought, John does, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Hereby we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, this is in opposition to Gnosticism, the impossibility for the Gnostics, they felt that Jesus could have actually come in the flesh because the flesh was evil. And so that created quite a problem for the church. And we see John addressing it frequently and as does Paul. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is, is come in the flesh is of God and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God and that is the spirit of Antichrist. Whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already it is in the world. You would think at the time that the apostles lived that the church would have had it easy. We've got the apostles. They can take care of all of this. It's not a problem. How can, we, how can we even have false teaching when we have the apostles? Well, as you know, many of the self-willed and evil people, even in the first century, oppose the apostles. Diotrephes and others. And so... That same problem, the same types of problems that we find, whether it's, whether it's tied to humanism, whether it's uh, part of the overall cultural wave now of immorality, uh, whether it's compromising with denominationalism. We've, we've seen it spread far and wide now, whether it's among Catholics, whether it's the Church of England, which now, uh, not that the Church of England is a religious institution by any real means, but the Church of England now puts their own blessing on same-sex marriages. In most religious organizations, I'm sure if you have friends who are part of any religion, they probably, unless they are one of those Methodist groups, they probably accept same-sex marriage and probably gender-affirming care for that matter. The Christian has to stand against this we have to stand against it for, the, for, for every reason that we read the pages of these books. And we can't be accepting of it, condoning. We can't con congratulate. I was in San Mateo. I was explaining to the brethren the other day. So, you know, some people see these different groups of uh, people. This is not tied to false teaching necessarily. This is a false lifestyle. You know, and they say, oh, that couple, they're kind of cute. They're not cute. No, it's not cute. It's disgusting. It's disgusting to God. And, and it's the kind of thing, again, this puts a target on our back. They're going to say, you, Steve Cohn, you're opposed to uh, abortion? One of our brethren, his daughter teaches at San Francisco State University. And they sent out a paper, and they wanted all the professors to sign their affirmation for something that had to do with abortion and another one for the LGB peoples, and she wouldn't sign it. 
and they've removed many of her classes, which means that removes much of her income. Now, this is not the subject she teaches, but this is what they do. You can lose your job. You can lose your friends. You might even lose some family. But what is it we have to do? We have to stand and contend for the faith, the faith that was once for all time delivered to the saints. We have to, as Jude is extending this out to the brethren, to all the brethren, to not allow false teaching into the church, to not allow false doctrine. And, and to bring this to uh, a close at this point in time, because I don't know how much time there is, but mm, it gives me these signals. Uh, but, but I want to go over to Galatians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Because Paul says something there that we all have to read, accept, understand the consequences, and let, be, let it be a moving and motivating force in our life. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might bring, that they might bring us under bondage. See, that is what these cultural appropriations, this is what this all does. It's to bring us un, into bondage, to muffle the sounds of the truth, to muffle the sounds of God, really. To whom, and this is the part that I think all of us should read and understand with regard to our inherent responsibility. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Do I get an invitation? Invitation. Invitation. Hmm? Yeah, that's what I thought. So I want to thank everyone for being here this afternoon. I want to thank the congregation and the elders for uh, letting me have the opportunity to come be with you again. It's been a few years. And we want to uh, be so thankful to God and our Father in Heaven, His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for the opportunity to, to be gathered here in this place to worship Him in spirit and in truth. It is that sacrifice that was made, that Jesus made on the cross for, for all of us. Uh, not only allows us to be here, but to, to have a certain peace that passes understanding, to have the, the hope of eternal salvation, to know that our sins can be remitted, to know that we can have a place that has been prepared for us, to know that we will see him and know him as he is. But in order to enjoy those things, one has to hear the word of God and believe it. One has to listen to what God says in his holy and divine book. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17. A person reading the New Testament will come to know Jesus, understand that he is God's son, his only begotten son, the monogenes. They will believe in him. Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And then what God requires of us, requires of all of us, if we're going to find that eternal home, is to change our lives so that they are in accordance with his will. That's called repentance. Repentance is when there's a change of mind that leads to a change of action that is in compliance with God's commands. That was exactly what Peter said on the day of Pentecost when people asked, what can we do to get right with God? That wasn't, that's a paraphrase. And he said, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. They knew exactly what he meant as a result of that sermon that he preached. So a person hearing the word of God, understanding their need to see Jesus as their Savior, repenting of sin, confessing him before men. I believe Brother Eric had that on his board this morning. Confess Jesus Christ before men. Be baptized into Christ for the remission of sin. And again, as we said earlier, understanding unto what we were being baptized. Coming out of that watery grave, as we understand Paul writing about it, especially in Romans chapter 6, a new creature, a new creation. To walk in newness of life. That opportunity, that chance, that hope that's only available in Jesus Christ. After one becomes a Christian, do we become perfect people who never, ever make another mistake? No, we don't. But we do know, 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, that if we confess our sin as New Testament Christians, that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all unrighteousness as well, as was also mentioned this morning. A New Testament Christian who has sinned publicly, and there's a need for uh, a public acknowledgement of that, Someone will come and pray on your behalf. It's so wonderful to have a Lord and Savior like Jesus Christ who makes our lives so much better, who gives us the perspective of the world to understand who we are, why we're here, and where we're going. If you're here this afternoon and there's a need to respond to the gospel, the invitation of Jesus Christ, the song has been selected. We ask that you come as we stand and sing.